from the Wind School Archives, read on December 5th, 2011. Introduction. This is the last of three lectures delivered by Nagaboshi Tomio over the period 1969 to 1974 at the request of the Cambridge University Buddhist Society. Nagaboshi taught meditation and karate do for some 14 years in England and abroad. He is one of the few Caucasians ever to actually study a completely spiritualized form of training under Buddhist masters of the art. Since 1969, he has been chief instructor to the Cambridge University Karate Do Society and was the founder of two residential centers. He was also the sole representative within Europe of the Congo Raiden Zen sect of Buddhism, a school stemming from the adamantine teaching path known as Vajrayana. Although ordained as a minister, he taught mainly in a lay capacity. His lecture is presented here in the hope that it will spread understanding of both Karate Do and Buddhist doctrine in an area few others are qualified to pronounce upon. Karate Do and Buddhism, delivered to the Cambridge University Buddhist Society on March 1974 by Reverend Nagaboshi Tomio of the Congo Ruji Temple. Question What is Karate Do? Nagaboshi answers. This question occurs many times and is subject to the varied forms of advertising propagating some forms of the art. Some of us may reply that karate is a brutal form of killing, a vicious and un-Buddhist activity, which should not be allowed at all. Such opinion is understandable. In modern times, an ever-increasing amount of publicity has appeared purporting to represent karate but demonstrates only that its practitioners are far from understanding the most ancient forms of the art. Many of you here already associate karate with spectacular feats of power, with the breaking of boards or the slaying of animals. Indeed, some of you may have even come here to see such things. Question. Can you tell us why karate is like this? Nagaboshi answers. The reasons for presenting the art of karate this way are many and varied, but I think they're due to two main factors. The first is economic necessity. Many Japanese and Okinawan students of karate found themselves in very hard times after the Second World War. Teaching karate was their only means of earning a livelihood. Even masters who understood the true nature of karate were forced to teach only what the public desired, that is, a watered-down version. By doing so, they both kept their students and financial security. The second factor was a shortage of Buddhist teachers. This is an important factor. The path of Karate Do is a way of awakening our most spiritual essence, not just a path of awakening physical prowess or power. The suffix Do distinguishes Karate's spiritual path from merely physical forms of endeavor. The way is synonymous to the Chinese word Tao and occurs very frequently in the early Chinese Buddhist scriptures. Karate, to be a spiritual science, must be a Do or a way and nothing else. Question. What is meant by Do? Nagaboshi answers. This is a very difficult question to answer because its implications stretch into many fields. In a strictly Buddhist view, a way is a manner of training which leads one to a direct experience of the vacuity of existence, called in Sanskrit, sunyata, the void. The physical school of teaching of which I am a member is called mushindo. In it, the doctrine of sunyata is held of prime importance to training. The spiritual lineage of which I am a member is called Kango Raiden Zen, And in its form, sunyata is seen as being an important aspect of Buddhist experience and realization. Voidness of body and voidness of mind are the two most important aspects of Buddhist karate do. Without some degree of their understanding, no one can be said to fully understand karate do itself. 
one of the tasks of physical training in karate is to translate this voidness experience into practical terms. The vehicle used to accomplish this task is the human body. In karate, the body is viewed as both the mirror to the void and the actual void itself. We tend to regard reflections as realities until we evolve our perception and then reality itself is experienced and the mirrors disappear. Question. Where did karate originate? Nagaboshi answers. Karate has a very long history. It predates Buddhism by many years, but it is in Buddhism that karate reached its most perfected form of expression. It was in the Buddhist eras that the most important forms of training were either innovated or notated for future students. Whether we consider karate to have evolved from the Hindu kshatriya art called Vajramukti, or the Thunderbolt Liberation, or not, realizing its actual experience is most relevant. That the Buddha himself was a member of the kshatriya caste is an interesting and notable fact. Bodhidharma was also a member of this caste, along with a great many notable Tantra teachers. Question. Do we need to follow a traditional method of study? Nagaboshi answers. Historical records and reliance upon past occurrence is only necessary when we are unable to see or create the original essence of teaching. In karate, this inability is not evident, for we can actually create, touch, experience, and realize the great void of sages' past if we apply ourselves assiduously and regularly to the task. Question. Can you expand on the karate doctrine of the way? Nagaboshi answers. A student's actual experience and mental reorientation of the way is one that cannot be contained or restricted to formalism. It rears its head and speaks in every walk of life. It is amply sufficient to see this act of change within one's own life to experience what it actually means. One who is not changed by his spiritual practice in karate does not understand it at all. This may be some fault of oneself or teachers, but the fact remains that without some change for the better, a student cannot be said to have experienced the raw taste of karate do. In karate do, the spiritual and physical transmission of skill is an actual event, not a theoretical occurrence. Question. Please tell us about esoteric schools. Nagaboshi answers. It is said within the Congo Raiden school that the saint Bodhidharma passed his most important teachings down to his student, Yi Ko, but that he saved the spirit of the teachings for his student, Yi Yu. Yi Yu was a master of the Congo teachings, and through Bodhidharma we trace a lineage directly to the Shakyamuni Buddha himself. Yi Yu was said to have uttered no words at all. That is, he refused to speak, or rather teach students by words. Because he didn't speak does not mean that he didn't, in fact, pass on knowledge. According to our accounts, he taught in movement rather than words. With special exercises, he succeeded in creating exactly the same mental and physical equilibrium in his students, which Bodhidharma himself resided. By means of reaching this stage of meditation, he was able to dismantle the teachings as if Bodhidharma spoke through his lips. Question. Can you explain transmission? Nagaboshi answers. The principle of wordless, direct transmission of knowledge is one that occurs over and again in the Zen annals. It is not so clear exactly what this entails. Transmission, or kuden, is an important feature of correct karate practice. But whether this transmission is solely a spiritual knowledge is hard to state. The ancient students lived with their masters and wizened not by actual teachings, but by a sort of osmosis, which occurred to them naturally as a result of being where they were, as they were, at that time. It is commonly thought that Bodhidharma did not teach scripture study or that he condemned it. This is not really true. He did show that one should not be caught by study as opposed to practice, 
Both are equally valid in the scheme of things. Question. Can you explain the different teachings regarding the entrances? Nagaboshi answers. Bodhidharma's doctrine of the four entrances stands as a sequel to the traditional teaching of the five entrances. It does not conflict with it, but rather extends its principles above and beyond the merely physical realm. Karate Do, the way of karate, does this also. Whether one understands one's experience being formed of the subjective, objective consciousness, elements belonging to the five organs, eye, ear, tongue, nose, etc., or as the conceptual exposition of their actual experience, entrance by reason, by will, etc., does not matter. It is relevant that you actually do something about yourself and your mental states of unskillfulness at any particular time. Question. Can you tell us more about faith, doubt, and experience in practice? Nagaboshi answers. Essentially, karate is a way of experience, and this accords in its purest form with the Buddha's teaching regarding cultivation of great doubt as well as great faith. One proves in terms of one's own experience what is taught. One does not rely upon word or even acts. One knows directly what the teachings state by means of one's own efforts, attentions, and realizations. Certainly, to do otherwise would result in a disaster. It's like believing oneself to actually be a Buddha and trying to perform miracles to onlookers. In the same manner, it's no use telling oneself that we are great, powerful karate men if, should the situation arise, we cannot exhibit this knowledge in some skillful manner for the benefit of others. Both these paths would lead to delusion and eventual suffering in one form or another. Likewise, one cannot condemn the Dharma nor karate without giving it serious consideration. It is all too easy to dismiss that which may actually change us or show us up for what we are. Many of the paths we encounter which would lead us to emancipation are vigorously shunned by some, and they can develop great fear of them. As you know, there are a great many idealistic Buddhists who would not dream of actually doing anything about Dharma. It's enough for them to talk about it. The same occurs within Karate Do. Question. Can you tell us about recognition and communication? Nagaboshi answers. Many have recited the Hanya Shinkyo, or Heart Sutra, and said, no ear, no eye, no tongue, no touch, etc., without realizing why they've said these words at all. We cannot truly deny that which we cannot affirm or have made real within us. The Shinkyo is a direct statement of realization, especially the realization of the basic Buddhist doctrine of the 18 elements. It shows that experience of their nature results in a natural freedom from them, and that experience can only precede freedom. Liberation is won in this world by knowing it in truth and in no other manner. The doctrine of communication is an important factor regarding all Buddhist statements. It is termed recognition, mitome within our school of teaching. Mitome is recognition not only of an outward fact or mind event, but of every phase of action or interaction that takes place within the sense realm. Mitome occurs within, without, and around us quite openly and spontaneously. Recognition involves many types of training. In Karate Do, self-recognition is called jiku, that is, self-emptying. This jiku is the heart of the Buddha's dharma. It is the heart of karate do, for by it we are liberated from the mental fetters which restrict all knowledge and liberation. These two factors of mitome and jiku constitute the main reason for many of the practices prevalent in real karate do, especially the aspect of fighting we call kumite. This aspect, so misunderstood by many, consists of a dynamic and cyclically regenerative experience of unfolding and revealing the masks which most of us wear during ordinary life, masks we never have to drop. By placing ourselves in potential danger, we are forced to act true to our real nature and conditioning. 
What we actually do is of no importance, but that we actually recognize and acknowledge it is. This is mitome. Question. Can you expand on why karate students practice fighting? Nagaboshi answers. Sparring presents us with a unique opportunity for instantaneous self-unmasking. It uses the very ego fear which develops the fetters to overcome itself. It's very skillful in this. Sparring is always done in a compassionate manner. I mean that when one is training in any real aspect of karate, one never really allows personal anger or resentments to develop to the degree that they will actually affect one's conduct towards others. They will occur, of course, often in remarkable manner. But in this practice, we should observe and not involve in them. Sparring in this sense is an extension of the very first mindfulness of body meditation as taught by the Buddha. At a more skillful level, the remaining three of the four foundation meditations will be practiced within sparring practice. It's very interesting if we look at the actual terminology of karate itself and relate it to Buddhist doctrines. As a fighting art, karate uses very strange terminology, particularly if you think of it solely as a fighting art. Regarding it as something else develops ample verification. The word used to describe sparring, kumite, is composed of two characters meaning meeting and hand. It does not mean fighting, but rather refers to an act of contact between them. The word used for block, uke, means receiving. It does not mean stopping, deterring, or even defending. It means to receive. This act of receiving a meeting in itself serves to show that fighting, as we normally conceive of it, is not understood in the same manner within karate. Question. If it's not the same, then what is it? Nagaboshi answers. This is something that you will have to experience for yourself. Remember clearly, both these words describe a definite interaction between two personalities, the sender and the receiver. It is this quality of interaction which determines karate sparring so different from exchanging mere fighting technique. If we look to another commonly used term, that of karate itself, we see that the two characters of which it is composed mean empty, that is kara, and hand, or te. This word karate was innovated in rather recent times. I've discovered that it was in fact also used in its Chinese form of pronunciation in the 1400s. It is therefore not a newer term as is generally supposed, but rather a return to an old form of noun. Kara means empty, empty of not only weapons, but also of intent. In other words, unwilled. Does this seem familiar ground? If we return again to the Hanya Shinkyo, we see that the actual term, which means no ear, no touch, etc., is kara itself. Thus, kara means void. In fact, it is the traditional translation of the Sanskrit term sunyata itself. In Sanskrit, we could translate the term karate into the words sunyata pani. Te means hand and also wielder or holder. In Chinese, Te served to also describe all arts requiring manual dexterity, such as pottery, painting, etc., and has the directly associated meaning of art. We could then translate karate as meaning he who wields the voidness, or he who grips the sunyata. What a difference this now makes to our understanding. It seems almost respectable to consider karate in this manner. An earlier term commonly used to describe Chinese karate forms in general is kempo, or in Chinese tongue, chuan fa. This means hand law. The figure meaning law translated into Sanskrit dharma, the teaching of the Buddha, the matrix of enlightenment itself. The whole term, kempo, again into Sanskrit, reads something similar to hasta dharma, hand law. Within Congo school, we take this name to refer especially to those exercises taught by St. Bodhidharma himself, and which helped combat the harmful effects of prolonged meditation amongst his monks at the Shorinji Temple. Now, doesn't all this seem strange? 
If you want to describe an art, you use terms referring directly to it. You don't include external subjects or inappropriate misleading terms. So why should they be here within karate? I think the answer is very simple. They are there because they were understood for what they were meant to be. They were not simply fighting names, but rather direct references to actual Dharma practices themselves. Their function was not nominal, but adjectival. One should not think, however, that all Buddhist monks trained in karate or that karate is the same as Buddhism itself. It is not much different, but it isn't the same. Karate is a way of approaching reality, the reality of self-voidness, and that approach has found its most useful home within Buddhist philosophical teaching. I'm quite certain that some Buddhist monks did in fact practice forms of karate and that in some cases the actual Dharma was preserved only because of their skill as traditional karate masters. I am equally convinced, however, that the real nature of training was easily forgotten or overlooked by many monks during the passage of history. Question. <clears throat> Could you tell us something about the meditation practices used in Mushindo Karate Do or Kango Raiden Zen? Nagaboshi answers. Aside from the special sitting meditations used in karate, the most important part of training is in what are called the shiki or kata. This word, meaning form, is exactly the same one as that used within Buddhist analysis to describe the factor which makes up the first constituent of the personality. Kata are forms of movement practiced in a preset sequence, order, and rhythm. As one increases in skill, different kata are taught that enable different levels of mind-body relationships to be experienced and understood by the participant. There are three main kata practiced within Mushindo school. By far the most important of these is San Chin. San Chin, meaning triple conflict, is the traditional teaching passed on by Saint Bodhidharma to Yi Yu. He, in turn, passed it down to his successor. From the practice of San Chin, one may experience the integration of all physical, mental, and spiritual energies and attain a state of mental firmness called Byodoshin, or Upeka in Sanskrit. A karate do student uses his kata and meditation exercises and trains constantly in them each and every day, trying to immerse himself in the movements both inwardly and outwardly. By their use, he can discover three things. One, what one has been. Two, what one is now. Three, how to progress. The main movements of kata are sets of ritual gestures called in, in Sanskrit, mudra. And these are put together in special rhythms of execution. Also, one practices certain breathing exercises while performing kata, so that the highest level of execution involves body, mind, and speech in their performance. Persistent practice in kata enables a student to awaken, realize, and transmutate his mental, vocal, and physical organisms into a completely different level of activity. Through practice of the movements, one enters into a state of concentration, ishin, and realization, jitsugen, which leads to utmost serenity. By means of this state of serenity, one perfects the mental qualities inducive to spiritual understanding. Movement must become stillness. Stillness must become movement. Without movement, there can be no meditation. Practice of the true karate do is then in perfect accordance with the root dharma of the Buddha. It contains selflessness, change, and suffering. All three of these states can be seen quite clearly by applying the principles of training to one's meditation practice. Indeed, continued practice increases one's awareness of these three constituents of life. Karate training opens areas of communication which are not normally experienced. I am referring to both physical and psychic realms. It's quite common in proper kata practice to develop knowledge of future events or even to tune in to another person's thoughts. Indeed, much karate training is designed especially for this latter purpose. 
Such skills are, however, not to be held to, as they are merely signs that one's energy is changing correctly. By physical realms, I refer especially to sexual attraction. It is a fact that one's awareness of bodily energies nearly always increases the desire for sexual activity. To actually indulge would, of course, disperse many of the created energies. And so for protection, a student's training in the traditional manner has to observe the precepts of restraint as taught by the Buddha. This is a very important point to note. To willingly release oneself to the emerging energies created by training is a very dangerous business and extremely difficult to disentangle oneself from at a later time. Because one is protected by precept observance, students have nothing to fear by training hard and well. Persistent meditation and restraint of energy will sublimate the bodily and mental energies to a high degree, and one would experience very unusual states of consciousness. The actual application of karate do techniques on a physical plane demonstrates quite clearly the presence of what we may term a supermind, or as I would prefer to call it, a bodic consciousness. For in the many self-defense situations that may occur, a great many of them could not be dealt with effectively if one is the victim of unskillful states of mind. There are many accounts in both China and Japan of warriors who fought and won great battles, even when hopelessly outnumbered. Such things could not occur in the ordinary scheme of mental events. Within Mushindo Karate, as indeed in any traditional school or teaching, there are three stages of effective relationships which occur in self-defense. These stages are called Sen, which is viewed as being of three distinct levels, depending upon the amount of skill and understanding present within the practitioner. The first level simply referred to as send. Here one deals with an attack in a free, easy, and totally effective manner. This is the highest realm of physical skill for ordinary karate practitioners, namely, to be able to defend oneself from any attack. The second level is referred to as go no sen. Here one deals with an attack just at the point of its initiation by halting a movement of assault before it actually forms into an attack. This stage is achieved by most karate masters. The third level is called Sen no Sen. One uses the bodic consciousness. It means halting the thought of attack as soon as it occurs within the would-be assailant and that he thinks of something else to do instead. Thus, no attack occurs at all. This is the reverse of the Jisho meditation or, as it is called in Sanskrit, the metta Bahavava. With this degree of skill, one extrudes only vibrations of peace and harmlessness and discourages any form of attack made upon oneself or others. It is generated by only the very highest masters of meditation. It is the aim of all students to actually achieve this degree of skillful practice and no other. One can see that the main art of karate do training is not to be effective in battle, but to be absolutely unnecessary. The act of battle is, however, still useful to learn from. We can experience with our fellow students all the ego-cracking situations of battle without the physical dangers of the real thing. It is not, however, a simple path, rather the reverse. A real battle would be much simpler and amenable thing to participate in. The defense of the ego sense, self-defense, is a state that Karate Do makes supreme use of and by its intricacies enables one to ultimately overcome its impure content. Another aspect of training is that of the communal effort. Within monasteries, the Sangha has traditionally been kept together by virtue of their common practices and observances. In karate, one does not have to stay in a monastery at all. It's, of course, more helpful to but the real principles of Mushindo training may, if one is skillful, be applied equally well outside of the monastic scheme. In this case, one's training hall becomes the spot where one communes with fellow students and the club itself begins to represent the Sangha. All true training halls possess a shrine, and to this, before and after each session, a prayer is spoken. The use of ritual is very strong within traditional schools of the way. When one begins to see these spiritual essences within karate, 
a degree of acknowledgement, or mitone, begins to appear, and one sees how important it is to observe just what is occurring within and without one's nature. In fact, if we did not acknowledge these mental events, we could never see just who the great masters are. Just now, there could be sitting amongst us a person who is actually a Buddha. Is it you? Or maybe you? Unless you look, you will not see. All forms of communication must be preceded by acknowledgement of some form or another. Without it, there's no teaching or indeed any teachers. I'm reminded of the man who turned away from Jesus when told to give up all his wealth. I wonder what happened to him. We're not told in scriptures. Just the same, I have no doubt that some people did regard the Buddha himself as a madman and took no notice of him at all. I wonder what happened to them. We shall never know. Until we recognize and acknowledge the Buddha heart within ourselves, we shall never see it within another. This form of communication must always occur before we can learn anything. Learning to be a real student is the beginning and end of enlightenment itself. There is nothing more. Transmission means no barrier to understanding, equality, non-differentiation between teacher and taught. Therefore, it is said that all the masters spoke with the same voice. Another important aspect of Karate Do is its emphasis upon developing the state of semwi, or fearlessness. In both Karate Do and Buddha Dharma, this state is achieved by removal of those parts of our minds which actually cause us to generate fear. This is done by fully understanding and then transcending the weakened states of consciousness, normally resulting in fear itself. It's not a generation of anything, that is, courage, etc., but rather the removal of obstacles to fearlessness itself. No attempt is actually made to say just what this state entails. One can only experience it for oneself. The in, or mudra, of fearlessness is much used within karate practice movements, forming as it does an important externalization of a principle to be recognized. In fact, within karate do, every obstacle is overcome by the generation of attention, realization, ending in transformation. In many ways, real karate training has foreshadowed all modern forms of communication, as is experienced with things like encounter groups, gestalt therapy, even Reiki and bioenergetics. The original karate contains all these and more. There is one other important aspect of karate training, but I cannot talk about it here. This is the mystical element. Many parts of the kata, and indeed the meditations, require direction of body and mind experiences in a manner similar to hatha yoga. There is an ancient tradition of this within karate schools. However, it is an intensely personal subject and not able to be openly discussed. As karate forms part of the tantric school known in China as the mystic Tsanmi sect, there are many practices which cannot even be superficially discussed. However, I hope that this talk has given you some understanding of what training in real karate do entails. Thank you all for coming.